morning. Good morning. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, we're going to start our time with worship, so please stand and join us. Congregational Church of Eastwood. It's uh, great to be here. We're here in the name of Jesus, yes? Amen. Amen. We sure are. And uh, welcome to people that are going to watch us on YouTube. Hello out there. Uh, it's so good to be with you this morning. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, one of them is that uh, for like about a decade, maybe a little more, churches in the local area have gathered on a regular basis for prayer. And we're having one of those gatherings tonight. It's at the Westford uh, Hill Church, the Congregational Church in Westford at 6 p.m., um, if you're available, uh, join us, and uh, these, this is a sweet, sweet time of getting together with believers from all over Northeast Connecticut, and uh, the Lord inhabits those places, and I can tell you they are powerful times of prayer. So join us uh, tonight. Uh, the auction is this next Saturday, and I'm, Sue Levitt asked me if she could have a microphone, and so I'm going to give her one as she comes right now. There you go. Great. It's always dangerous to give me a microphone. Thank you so much. Pastor Mike, um, the auction is just getting to be overwhelmingly wonderful. So if you check us out on the Fabulously Fun Family Fundraiser Facebook page, you'll see a listing of almost, I've posted almost everything that's been contributed. So if you want to make a bid because you can't be there, please just text me or email me your bid and we'll make sure that you it's used. I also want to say that we still have these note cards, which we're just accepting donations, whatever you want to do. There's a bunch of them on the table over there. And then the last thing is, this is gorgeous. This is just for viewing. This is a framed print 
of some burned pages from the hymnals that were found, and it's framed with wood from the beams that were left at the church. So these will be available for sale at the auction. It, it, they are stunning. You can't have these because Linda's going to pay mucho dollars for them. So <laughs> if you could please announce the auction to your friends, bring lots of friends, your credit card, your checkbook, or some, we'll even take cold hard cash. So we hope that you're able to come. The auction starts at 3 and runs till 4.30, but there's just so much more. There are games for kids, they have prizes, they have, what is it called, dirt and worms from Bucks for the kids, not for us, but for the kids. And, and just a concert by the Stephen Bell Trio. So please join us. It's, the whole event begins at 3, and it's supposed to be over by 7.30. Hope to see you there. Thank you, Seth. Uh, just a, another couple quick ones for you. Um, we uh, have our Frog Jump and Band concert a week after that, so uh, two weeks from yesterday. And uh, I sent in an email looking for helpers, and a couple of you responded. So uh, I'll just kind of leave that. We need help. Uh, we have a, a lot of our stalwarts uh, are unable to be there for various, like, uh, you know, family things and so forth. So if you are in town on the 13th, uh, please come and serve. Uh, again, this is a, a fun event, but it's not for our fun. It's to bless the community. So this is an opportunity to serve the Lord by being the best hosts and hostesses we can. Uh, that's uh, July uh, 13th, so uh, two weeks from yesterday. So uh, uh, let me know. We got uh, deacons that are putting together teams to get stuff done, and we need to fill out those teams. Uh, and then that, that same week, uh, that same week, same weekend, uh, and the day afterwards, uh, Evan Burgess, who is uh, the candidate that the pastoral search committee and the elders believe is the man that is God calling to come join the work here, um, he will be with us and will be preaching on the 14th. And uh, so you get a chance to, uh, to have time with him. Also, after that worship service, we're going to have a time of uh, like questions and answers uh, to get to know him and his wife, Chelsea, and their little guy, Roman, who I think like turned four maybe this week. And uh, so we're excited about the prospects there. And just for your, like, your thought process, uh, that would be on the 14th. There'll be an expectation of a congregational meeting on the 21st. Uh, to vote on whether or not you believe that God is calling Evan to be here. Okay, so uh, exciting stuff. Please, please be in prayer about all these things. And, uh, and now, of course, my Bible that was open to the right page is not. So you have to wait. This morning's sermon will be on patience. Honest. Yeah. Uh-oh, never pray for patience, by the way. Think about that. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Let's join together as we praise him in song.
Righteousness, oh God, how we need you more than ever. We need you every hour of every day in all of our lives. We thank you for the breath of life. We thank you for this day and all the blessings you bestow upon us each and every day, Lord. May we never forget that. Speak to us now through your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. Have a seat if you would, please. And uh, youngins, you guys, uh, you guys are sprung to go to uh, Bible Explorers. Good morning. Isn't that the truth, though? I hope you're here because you know that you need Jesus. And uh, I know that I come every week when I can because I need him. Um, listen to these words from Isaiah 55. Everyone, come. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy Listen diligently to me, Isaiah says, and eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. I think he's talking about drinking there from the word of God and from God's spirit. And as the song just said, we drink in the righteousness of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that it's free to come to you. We don't have to pay at the door. We don't have to. Uh, we don't have to give anything to you, except our sin. And then, in exchange, we get to drink in your righteousness. Thank you for letting us come freely, boldly, as it says in Hebrews, before the throne of grace because of your son, Jesus, who offers us his righteousness in place of our sin. And we know it costs a great amount. Forgiveness is never free, and you paid a big price to forgive us. We thank you and praise you. Father, we bring before you our world. It's in chaos, wars, and just fighting, uh, battles and politics, real battles with bullets. Father, we pray for peace. We pray that you would bring upon us a spirit of peace in this world. May your spirit reign, and may your church be a light to those who need you, who need to come to you to gain that free access through Jesus. Thank you that you invite us to come in for free and, and just love you and serve you. That's what we want to do this morning. So as Pastor Mike lays out the banquet table before us of your word, we pray that we would eat and drink and draw it in and be ready for the next week. Whatever comes, may we live each day, Lord, in expectation of your coming to be doing your work here on earth. Father, we fall short so often, and I pray that you would forgive us for doing things that we shouldn't have done this week and for not doing some of the things that we should have done. We bring them to you and say we're weak, we're feeble, we can never live up to your righteousness. Father, we take a minute here to re repent of our sins. We want to turn around, Lord. We don't want to do these things anymore. Take them away as far as the east is from the west and praise you for it. We thank you that you sent your son, taught us, and not only gave his life from us, but taught us how to live, and he taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, James. Yeah, there are too many buttons. We've got a new uh, microphone. We've got a new uh, bunch of sound gear back there. And, uh, and I was warned that uh, because it's new, it might glitch. And so if it does, uh, blame Mike. Good. Well, good morning. We're going to be opening up the Word of God this morning to um, the first letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy. And we're going to be talking about uh, the next in our series of fruits of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Galatians, Paul writes that we need to put off the the things of the flesh because the outcome of following the flesh is a long list of things that are icky and not okay. But if you're a follower of Jesus, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, and you can choose to let the Spirit be in charge of your life. And then he lists the things that will flow out of your life from the Holy Spirit, who is the third person of God, fully God, who lives in the heart and life of every follower of Jesus. Are there any followers of Jesus in here? Good, okay, so the Holy Spirit's like all over this place right now. And, and his fruit, what comes out of the follower of Jesus by virtue and work of the Holy Spirit, there's a list, and there are nine of them. Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I thought it was a good summer series to talk about those each in turn. We've already talked about love and joy and peace. And this morning's sermon is on patience. I'm taking the impatience. I like to see stuff happen. And a favorite cartoon of mine from uh, back in the day, and, and I, in terms of the, the language in the cartoon, I have to bring it up to like uh, uh, church standards. And it's a, a couple of vultures, and they're standing on the dead limb of a dead tree. I don't standing like perched there, right? Being all vultury and ugly. You know, when people see them flying, they go, oh, look, a beautiful eagle. No, actually, if it's, by the way, here's a professional tip. If they're if the, fing- if the feathers on their wingtips are splayed out like my fingers are, when you get up close, that's one ugly sucker, okay? With like bald and nasty looking warts kind of looking thing. And they eat carrion, right? They eat, uh, they're, they're scavengers. They, they dine on roadkill. And these two vultures sit on the tree. One of them leans the other and says, patience my eye. Let's go kill something. See, because if you are a scavenger bird and you eat things that have already died and nothing died recently, you're hungry, you're uncomfortable, and you want the discomfort to end to satisfy your appetite, and so you become impatient. Ever felt like a vulture? Where you're experiencing discomfort? You're noticing the passage of time going, and we got to get something done here. And we become impatient. Now, we're, we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit here. And, and so if I was going to preach about this, uh, you know, I, I could look at biblical examples of Bible characters famous for their patience. In fact, I, I bet you can finish this sentence. The patience of Job, right? And we could take a look at Job and, his, and, and, and what happens in that book and look at Job as exemplary of patience, but Job's patience is human patience. And the Holy Spirit that you have in you is not human, it's God. He is God. And so I want to look at the patience of God this morning. And we're going to do it as it is brought up in the the kind of the introductory section of uh, the Apostle Paul's letter to Timothy. Uh, A little quick background, Uh, Timothy is the pastor of the church in a place called Ephesus. He had been like a young guy who, um, the evidence is, came to faith as a result of Paul's preaching uh, on his first missionary trip. And then on his second missionary trip, he ends up joining Paul's entourage. And he's like a young guy, and, and he's following Paul around, watching him lead and teach, and he ends up as the pastor in Ephesus. I want to talk about Paul just for a minute. If you've been with us, we were working our way through the book of Acts, and so you'd be familiar with the story. 
But this guy, Paul, he began life with a name Saul. He was born in a Roman colony called Tarsus. He was well-educated in matters Greek, like philosophy and literature, poetry, uh, and, and rhetoric, Greek rhetoric. Uh, but the bulk of his teaching was actually under the tutelage of a Pharisee named Gamaliel, as, and he became part of that sect, the Pharisees, that were the religious leaders, that bunch, in Jesus' ministry who most opposed him. They were ones that were committed to, to the teaching and understanding and thorough application of Torah, the law, the first five books of the Bible, and all those rabbinic teachings. And so they were like just all about being really careful to follow God's instructions. And they built their whole life and ministry on those ideas, which Jesus teaches are actually not the main event. The main event is a right relationship with God. And following God in obedience follows, doesn't lead. And so these guys, the Pharisees, were threatened. And this young guy, Paul, we know him as Paul, but Saul of Tarsus, who was probably um, had a birth date similar to Jesus, same kind of time frame and age. He is a wild-eyed zealot to make this Christian thing stop because Jesus was a threat. Jesus was viewed as like blasphemous in his claims of being the son of God. And so Saul thought he was on God's side as he participated and led the charge in persecuting the church. And you remember the story, he's on his way to Damascus. He's on the road to Damascus. He has warrants for the arrest, uh, arrest of Jews that have become Christians that they might be arrested or even put to death. And the Lord grabs a hold of him. He is a wicked guy and the Lord grabs hold of him. He doesn't even know he's wicked. And the Lord grabs a hold of him and there's a bright light and, and a voice says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he goes, like, you know, who are you, master? Like, talking to me. I, who am I persecuting? He said, I'm Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. And that, that grab by Jesus, the invasion of the Holy Spirit, Paul comes to faith. He is born again. And he goes from being a wild-eyed zealot opposed to Jesus to being a wild-eyed zealot proclaiming Jesus. It's an amazing transformation. Now, you need to know that background to understand what he's going to write to Timothy. And so that's why you have that Bible lesson there. So now let's look at these words written um, probably about uh, a couple of decades later uh, to uh, Timothy. I invite you to stand. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 12 is where I'm going to begin. Again, this is Paul to Timothy. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted in ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, Father, thank you for these words. Words that transform. Words of life and power. Your word is sharper than a double-edged sword. It could come in and divide joint and marrow and soul and spirit tests and measures the hearts and attitudes that we have. And Father, I ask now that your word would penetrate deeply as you put it to work in our lives for your glory and for your kingdom purposes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, grab a seat if you would, please. Okay, so again, this is Kind of the introductory part of this letter, the bulk of the letter uh, are instructions to a pastor about church affairs. And so that's a very useful book in the Bible for us as a church. 
But in this introductory part, he speaks of like kind of his origin story here. And he thanks Jesus for giving him the strength and the calling to serve him, even though he was formerly, and then he lists some kind of big dog sins, right? Blasphemer. That's one that, that, that speaks badly of God. In this particular case, the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. Uh, that he was a persecutor. We already talked about that. And that he was an insolent opponent. So when, when, when Jesus and, his, and his, his bubbas are around, he is just like angry and there's animus and he's like a nasty guy. And the Greek word that is there actually like suggests like an excessive nastiness, the way he was doing business. And so he, he praises him. But then he says, that like this, this is the saying, it's so important that Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. And so what he invites us to do is to not compare ourselves to him other than know that he was a bad, bad, bad boy and Jesus saved him anyway. Is that good news to anybody in this room? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. And then he said that he did it for this reason. I receive mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost, speaking of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience. And so what I want to focus us on right now is the idea of the perfect patience of Jesus, the perfect patience of God. Because when we are told that we have the Holy Spirit and bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, we're talking about the same patience, the patience of the living God. Not the patience of Pastor Mike, not the patience of Jen, not, not the patience of, uh, let me pick, pick on somebody else, Josh. Not our patience, his patience. So let's take a look at like, what's, what's on here, okay? First of all, I would invite us to like, kind of think about that word patience and what it means. Um, there are several words in Greek that mean patience. We just use one word, patience. And so we've got to talk about like, like, like how deep and wide is the patience we're talking about. Uh, one of the Greek words, it's not this word, but describes the kind of patience that we need like all the time. A couple of weeks ago, I, you guys know I'm a surfer, I was coming out of the water at Point Judith, the rocks are sharp, and I dinged the, in, you know, like the, the arch of this foot, and a couple days later I noticed that the ding was not getting smaller, it was getting larger. And I kept messing with it with like, you know, neosporin and band-aids and stuff for a couple of weeks. And a week ago Friday I said, you know what, this is like not improving. And the weekend's coming, and I don't want to be that guy where they say, I can't believe he didn't go see the doctor, and they had to amputate his foot. And, and so I call the doctor's office at about 2, 2.30 on a Friday, and I go, look, I know that this is crazy. I know you guys are real busy. I know that doing this on a Friday afternoon is not going to happen, but is there any chance? And there was a chance. The lady on the phone said, we can see you at 4.20. Okay. And I go, okay. But I had like a grandkid I was watching, so I had to do like, you know, juggling balls and get that sorted and I get to the doctor's office at about 4.12 and I go in and, and when, I, when I'm checking in and they have this status board and it has the various practitioners up on the status board and, the, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and uh, Dr. O'Neill, that's my, that's my primary care physician, like one hour behind. But I was supposed to see an APRN and they have a couple of APRNs that says on time, on time, on time, awesome. So I sit down and at 420, like, nothing happens. At 425, some older fellow with, like, an oxygen bottle comes in and sits down. And, he's, and then they come up and, and they say, Michael. And I go, yes. I go, not that one, that one. And then he goes in. And I'm starting to think, lies. On time, lies. And I'm starting to, like, like feel like some kind of a victim, right? And, and it... 4.20 turns to 4.30, turns to 4.40, turns to 5 o'clock. 5.10, I go in. And the whole time, I'm, I'm, I'm getting more and more, dare I say it, impatient. Anybody ever get impatient when that kind of thing happens? Amen. Amen. Repent. Now that you've confessed, you're most of the way there, okay? But I was getting impatient, but let, let, let's just think about this for a minute. Like, what was the setting I was in? It was, it was hot that afternoon. The office was air-conditioned. Back in the day, I would have enjoyed reading National Geographic because I don't have a subscription or maybe even that Highlights magazine that they had for kids in the doctor's office, right? 
But it's, it's not then, it's now. And, and so I had my phone, you know, and so I could like watch little surfing YouTubes or, or, or get caught up on, on, on some emails or some text messages. And so, yeah, time was passing and I was getting irritated about the passage of time, but I was not being like blasphemed, persecuted and facing an insolent opponent. I was just chilling in the doctor's office. Isn't it funny how we do that? Get all jacked up about how somebody's stealing my time? News alert, Sparky. You don't own any time. It's all God's. So let me talk about, that's by the way, that word for patience, that's not the one that's used here or in the fruit of the Spirit passage or a couple other passages we'll touch on this morning. It's a different word. And it's, it's well translated in the King James Version that calls it long-suffering. Here's what it looks like. It's hot and humid out there. Well, it's humid anyway. It's really not that hot yet, but it's, it's miserable, right? Yankees nod yes. People from the South go, I don't know. But, right, so you get that hot heat spell. I mean, we just had one, right, where it goes on for several days, and like everything in your house gets hot, okay? Like the, like the bathroom floor gets hot. Like the carpets get hot. The walls get hot. And most of all, the mattress and the sheets get hot. And then at night, like there's no wind, and you got the windows open, and you're laying there, and you're, you're sweating, and, and, and you got to get up and go to work in the morning, and you look at the clock, it's 11 o'clock, you say, am I ever going to get to sleep? I'm so miserable, and I can't get to sleep. And then, and then you, you lay there, and you want to toss and turn, but you know that's like movement, it'll make you sweat more, right? Anybody with me? Probably not, because most of it's air conditioning, you have a fan. So the scenario is no air conditioning, no fan, no wind, windows are open. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning, you're still not asleep. And then you are privileged to host a very special guest. (laughs) And there you are, talking to the fellows, you're in your boxers on top of the sheets because it's so hot. And now you have been dished up. It's funny, right? But when it talks about the perfect patience of Jesus. We're talking about a Jesus that is enduring not just the passage of time, but aggravation, pain, discomfort. You do know that when you were not yet a follower of Jesus and you were sinning against him, that he experienced that as discomfort. You know that, right? That when you do stuff that offends God, it offends him. Do you like getting offended? Me neither. He grieves over what you do. Do you like to grieve or grieve? Me neither. And so our sin is basically like the heat, the humidity, and the mosquito. And yet our Lord Jesus, I'll say it differently, he puts up with us. When it says that his patience is perfect, by the way, I'm a big fan of the English Standard Version, but this is like, actually in a long time, the first vocabulary word that I came across, I said, I got to... I gotta describe this a little differently. Because the, the, the word that is there in the original text t- talks about like complete, consonant, whole, full. It means like, you know, all, like every extent of it. Okay, so I don't know about you, but like if I'm dealing with something that is making me struggle with being patient, a wait in a doctor's office, a hot night with a mosquito in the room, I could give you a list of people in my life, right? Where Things are uncomfortable. You know, when, when, when we are dealing with that, and we're patient, and we're patient, and we're patient, and then what do we do? It says, I, my patience, what, ran out, right? When suddenly, the, when suddenly we start to act on it, and we get all cranky and angry and stuff, right? My patience ran out. The idea here when it uses this word perfect is patience that never, ever, ever runs out. And you think about the patience of God being something over like long periods of time. I mean, he creates Adam, right, out of the dusty earth, breathes life into him. When Adam becomes conscious, he says, like, here's the plan, right? You're going to get to tend this garden. You can't eat of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't be eating that fruit. For the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. And he makes Eve, and he gives some instructions, go forth and multiply. See, here, just a little pause here. God's meta-narrative, his big plan is... He is building a kingdom at the other end of this age. And that kingdom is filled with saints. A saint is anybody who has put their trust in Jesus and made clean and holy by his blood. 
by his death on the cross. And these saints are ones that have chosen Jesus in response to his love for us. And so it's like a big giant like family of love, this kingdom. And it's going to be forever and ever and ever more with no sin, with no sickness, with no tears, everlasting life. He's building a kingdom. It's populated by all these, all these souls, right? All these people. Where do they come from? They come from the biological reproduction of one man and one woman named Adam and Eve. So the idea of couples coming together and making little bambini, that's Italian. That's not Latin. Well, maybe it is, but certainly not Greek. Okay, but making babies, right? Okay, the, the idea is that, 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 that God gives Adam and Eve the mandate to go forth and multiply and to subdue the earth, the cultural mandate, and to, to move humanity from one guy made out of dirt to a gazillion people in a great new heavenly holy city. And so, the dummies fall for the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, who says, eat the fruit, and they eat the fruit. And what happens? The grace, the mercy, and the patience of God takes over. Instead of like vaporizing them for being rebellious numbskulls, the Bible says that Adam lived 930 years. Just think of the population of humans that he got to see that were part of the instruction that God gave, or the result of the instruction God gave Adam and his wife to go forth and multiply. Our great God put up with Adam after he offended, and now he is against God. He's standing against him because of his sin nature. He put up with him for like the better part of a millennia. And then, you know, from the rest of the story, right, of course, you know, big event, the flood, but then there's a restart with Noah and his boys and their wives, and, 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 and the story continues, and we end up with this, this guy, Abram, and, and, and from him, he's the patriarch, from him comes the nation of Israel, they get incubated in Egypt, and they become a great nation in Egypt. We're talking about the passage now from like the beginning of the story for generations and generations, and we start to get kind of accurate measure on the clock about the time of Abraham, which is about, oh, 2000 BC, and, and like after like 500 years after Abraham, these guys are, are in Egypt and they get set free. Remember the story, the, 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 the plagues, the, the, the parting of the Red Sea, and they are now on the other side of the Red Sea, Pharaoh and his army have been destroyed, and they are free to go now to the promised land, and their first stop is at the foot of a mountain, Mount Sinai. And then though there the Lord shows up on top of the mountain. Great reading, by the way, in Exodus. You know, with, with manifestations of, of, of clouds and darkness and rumblings and the very voice of God being heard by the people. And Moses, the leader, is God's guy. And so Moses, and Moses is told by God, here's the deal. That these people, these are the people that, that I created and they're my chosen people. And I will be their God, and they will be my people, but here's the deal. I'm going to give you instructions on how I want you to live, and if you're in and say, I will follow these instructions, I'll be your God, you'll be my people. And you know what? They, they, Moses, without a lot of detail, says, here's the deal. And you know what they say? We're in. Yes, sir, Bob, we're going to follow God. Well, then Moses goes up on the mountain for 40 days because God's got more stuff to tell him. Right after he leaves, his brother Aaron goes, man... I'm getting impatient here. I mean, he's been gone for like a week, and we don't know what happened to him. And so I know, let's melt down some jewelry and make a statue out of gold of like a, a baby cow, a calf, and start worshiping that. I go, like, are you kidding me? I mean, God just said to him, he goes, okay, the first deal is you shall have no other gods before me. Eh. You shall make no graven images and worship them. Eh. You shall not use my Lord in, the Lord's name in vain. Go, go read what they say. They say, this is the Lord, this, ca this calf. So they're, like three, they're pounding through the Ten Commandments. Like one, two, three. So I know, let's like start murdering people and bearing false witness and stuff. It's like the weirdest thing, right? But that's our nature, isn't it? And how does God respond? Well, there are consequences. But that same tribe, that same tribe are the ancestors of the Jews alive today. But more importantly, they are the ancestors of Jesus, who is the Christ, 
who was born 1,400 years later. And in those 1,400 years, you know what they kept doing? They kept saying, yep, Lord, we're in. We're good, we're good. And then they would wander away. And what would he do? He would put up with them. That's the patience of God. And they would do it over again and over and again and over again and over again. And you have a 1,000 years of that recorded between the, book of, uh, between the book of Exodus and the last chapter of the historic books in the Old Testament. For a thousand years they did that. And who put up with them? A God who loves us so. So I'm trying to paint a picture of the enormity of the patience of God. And then Jesus comes. So now the whole narrative is about three, is a, well, a, uh, you know, a good, a good what, 2,000 years long at this point, 1,500 years, 2,000 years long. And then Jesus comes. And then Jesus brings the gospel, brings the good news. Himself is the gospel. He dies for our sins. He is buried. He rises again. He ascends up to heaven, having promised that I'm going to come back. And then, like, just like the Israelites in the desert, it's like, well, Moses has been gone for like a week, you know? So Jesus is like, where is he? And scoffers start coming and saying to the people in the church, you, you, you said this Jesus who left promised to come back. Well, where is he? I mean, it's been, it's been decades now, and like your people are dying, they're not going to heaven, everybody, it's, everything is the same. Everything is the same, and, 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 and so the Apostle Peter, he has to deal with this, and he does in a letter, his second letter, and he says these words, he says, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of, this, of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But now here it comes. But do not, not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come, dot, dot, dot. So here's what I want you to see. This perfect patience of Jesus is all about putting up with us on the expectation that we will eventually turn to him and join that great throng that will be in the heavenlies for eternity. So now, what's that got to do with us? Well, I guess maybe the first thing is, the patience of God can only be yours in your life if you've received the Holy Spirit in your life, and you only receive the Holy Spirit by putting your trust in Jesus. So if you put your trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit moves in, now you have the gift. And so I would offer to you, if you haven't considered Jesus in a serious way before, that, I mean, here's the deal, right? You're, you're a hot mess. The Lord is patient. He's waiting for you to turn to him. And in order to make that work, as far as being reconciled, he sent his son, Jesus, who lived that perfect, sinless life. And when he died, he paid the penalty. He took away the obstacle to your entrance into his kingdom. And then he rose again and proved that the is who he says he is, and demonstrated that he actually accomplished victory over death. And then he ascends into heaven, having promised to come back, and he left this message. Put your trust in him, you'll be right with God. And when you're right with God, the Holy Spirit shows up. And then guess what starts to flow in abundance in your life? Love and joy and peace and patience and five more we'll get to. So Followers of Jesus, I ask for a show of hands, that's most of us here. You got this in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit is in you. And, and, and you know what? Just think about those other fruits of the Spirit. You have the love it takes to put up with a knucklehead because it's the fruit of the Spirit in you. You have the joy that can't be taken from you to like cruise through difficult stuff. It's already in you. It's already yours. You have the peace, peace with God. And the ability to have peace with other people, it's already in you. So I, I would say as far as patience... It's in you, in the Holy Spirit, and the, and the Holy Spirit in, in, in whole has given you what you can, like, with confidence, just say, patience, I got this. But you really don't. It's the Holy Spirit. And so it has to do with letting the Holy Spirit do this stuff that you might bear the fruit. 
Be patient as Jesus is patient. And you can because the Holy Spirit's in you who gives you the ability to be patient as Jesus is patient. You know, we talked about like the different kind of angles on, on patience. You know, one is like we need it when it takes more time than, than I'd like. I mentioned it before, I'll say it again. The time that you feel is being wasted is, in God's economy, it's not wasted, but it's not your time in the first place. So, like, get over it, okay? As, as I was thinking about ways to illustrate this, I, I thought of a couple things. I, I can't remember who said this, uh, uh, you know, pop culture of my generation. It, it, was, it was either, um, it was either uh, uh, Kelsey Grammer in Frasier, or uh, I can't remember the name of the, the guy who played the psychiatrist in What About Bob? And it's like, they, these are like psychiatrists, right? The phone rings, and he looks at the caller ID, and he says, this better be good. How do you respond when people interrupt you? In fact, as I was working on this, the note I wrote down, this was ironic. I'm working on this yesterday morning. I'm in my office using my time to make my sermon better. So I'm doing sermon prep on my time. And what I wrote down, I'm typing, and I go, I, you know, I can talk about office interruptions. And I type those words, and yeah, she's raising her hand. I hear the door to the office open. I go, no, 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 no. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. There was a guy, there was a guy about know, 25 years ago. His name was Richard Swenson, Christian physician. He wrote a great book. I, I commend it to you even. By the way, not all old books are like obsolete. This is a very good book. The title of the book is Margin. And what he talks about, he was a physician, super busy. His wife was crazy busy in the church. And in the opening of the book, he's not like talking like getting home at work, from work at 8.30 when he's supposed to be home at 5. And he pulls in the driveway, and his wife's car is in the driveway, not in the garage. And he finds her in the car weeping because she's just so overwhelmed. She's been doing like churchy stuff all day. She's just home late from a women's Bible study. And he writes this book, and he says, you need like margin in your life. You need margin in your finances. You need margin in your physical health. You need emotional margin in your life. He said, most of all, and I, I would offer to you that I think contemporary American Christians, the commodity that you cherish and hold the most tightly to is your time, which is ironic because it's not your time in the first place. Right? I, it, it, it's easier to get people to write a check than it is to, to change their schedule. It's easier. And see, he said that he had this one line in the book that just really grabbed me because I'm a schedule guy. I got a day timer, old school paper, right? And it's like, you know, you know like yesterday, you know, 7 to 8.30, men's Bible study. Uh, you know, 9 o'clock, uh, help the band get in here for their equipment, okay? Like 9.15 to 12, like sermon prep. It's, I'm, I'm like checking them off. It's all, it's my plan. And I laid that off. Out. And then Sue comes in the office and all of a sudden I got another entry, but I didn't put it there. But who did? Swenson says it this way, the interruptions are the ministry. My schedule and my plan is my schedule and my plan, and it may not even remotely relate to God's plan for my time. And so that's a, core, that's a hard issue. Like, just be open. That when the Lord brings you somebody, but by the way, I'm going to tell you something here, that, that just take all of this truth. This is a very important truth. The relationships you have are way, way, way more important and more highly valued than the time you have. Your relationships. By the way, if, if somebody walks into the pastor's office and they're burdened about something, and I basically say, not on a calendar. How does that go for them? If they're burdened, if they've got something they want to share, they, they, they want prayer. We, we need to understand that the time is not ours. So when, when we need patience to deal with time taking longer than we think we ought to, think about these things, that, that God gives us so much time. We should use it well. Like when I'm in the doctor's office, you know, and yeah, I'd say watching surfing videos, that, that's probably not the best way to redeem that time. You know, but maybe, you know, checking in with some people I haven't seen lately, like how are you with a text message? Every time we get a delay, we can redeem the time. I can remember um, when I was a new Christian, um, the church I was going to had like no interest in this book, and I was a believer, and I didn't figure out that that was important for almost two years. And somebody mentioned to me there was such a thing as Christian talk radio, and I started listening to WMCA out of New York, and I, there were some great preachers on the radio, and I had, had a long commute, not, not measured in miles, but in time, Interstate 95 from east to New Haven down to Fairfield County. 
And, and I remember there was one morning, and again, in this, like, this crazy traffic jam, and I go, you got to be kidding me. Like, I, you know, I got like a 715 meeting, and, and I'm stuck here, and it's going to take forever. But the guy that was on the radio from 730 to 8 had a message I needed to hear, and it was way more important than the meeting. See, God's in control of my time. So that's kind of the first idea. And then the second one here is that, that idea, that, that long-suffering idea, right? So like, like things that need patience are when time is taken more than I think it ought to, but it's also when there is discomfort involved. And that's where the rubber really meets the road. I said that your relationships are more important than your time. And now if the relationship is making your life miserable, and what do you want to do? Make it end, right? Hot and humid, it's like, Lord, bring a cold front. Hot and humid, run to Walmart, buy an air conditioner, right? I want to make it stop. And I'm anxious to get that done. Praise God, Walmart's open 24 hours, so you can go at 2 o'clock in the morning and get an air conditioner. Then they tell you they're sold out. Surprise. Patience lesson from the Lord. Okay, but, but, but when people, like, here's something. Like, Jesus did not give up on Adam and Eve or on the descendants of Abraham. But most importantly, he didn't give up on you. Now, if you had an adult conversion, that makes a whole lot more sense than if you were a little kid. But I got news for you. I know a lot of people that had little kid conversions that still do stuff that irritates Jesus. They've been Christians for a long time. They're leaders in churches. All the time, like we're poking Jesus with a stick with our attitudes, our behaviors, our selfishness, our proclivities, our habits, all the time. And he puts up with us. And he puts up with us with purpose that we might be well, that we might be whole, whole, that we might be redeemed, that we might have eternal life. Brothers and sisters, that's the way we need to be with the patience of Jesus and before that the love of Jesus, the joy of Jesus, and the peace of Jesus. That's the way we need to be with the people around us that are irritating us. Put up with them. I'm going to offer to you that if you're a Christian, you do not have permission to dismiss people who annoy you. You don't. What you have permission to do is step into the patience that God has given you and to love them and to wait. That in the Lord's perfect timing, he may do the incredible transformative work that you would want for them because it's best for them. Not because it will make your suffering go away. Now, those are challenging words, right? But I, but I think that's what on display here when, when Paul says that, look, I was the worst among sinners. I was a blasphemer. I was, uh, I was a, a persecutor. I was an insolent opponent. And he waited me out. And, and when, I, when he brought me to himself, I, did you notice that, that it says, although formerly, formerly. So, so if there's a, like a list of stuff that you've done to offend God, you know, maybe you were a blasphemer and a persecutor, or maybe you were a, maybe you were a thief and a gossip, or maybe you were, had an adulterous heart, like whatever that list is, when you come to Jesus, it gets a big stamp on it that says formerly, because that's not you anymore. You've been delivered. You're a child of the living God, accepted, redeemed, and loved by him, and given the Spirit of God, that you might share that same forbearance, that same patience with the people around you that are treating you like Saul treated Jesus. Um, help, I'm preaching and I can't find a conclusion. These things are a matter of the heart, right? It's pretty straightforward, right? My life is not about me, it's about others. My life in Christ is about him. He is the principal other. And the motivations of my life should be about the ones that he died for. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, verse 15, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. So our mission has everything to do with the sinners in our lives. And the sinners in our lives are the ones most likely to test our patience. Amen? 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 Okay, just check it. Okay. They're the ones most likely to test our patience. But if we have the perfect patience of God in us by the Holy Spirit, we have patience that never comes to an end, never gives itself over to impatience. And that's a beautiful, beautiful gift we have. And can you imagine, just, just think about the world around us. I mean, look at it. I don't know how, I don't count people. I'm afraid to because when David did, there was a plague and killed a bunch of them. 
So I don't know how many people are here today, but I just imagine if all of us in all the places we were started getting famous for being the patient ones, the ones that when you're treated poorly are able to endure that, and even to tap into the love, the joy, and the peace that the Holy Spirit has also given you, and then the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, and the self-control that are also part of the package. Well, you tap into that stuff around people, that's going to have an impact, don't you think? Of course it will. But that's because we're here, just like Paul said. Paul writes that he did this for me that I might be an example of how the perfect patience of Jesus works. Guess what we get to be? We get to be examples of the way the perfect patience of Jesus works. And what a privilege, and what a delight, and what a great high calling. And as I look at all you all, I'm thinking of some, I'm looking at some real patient face, faces here because I've seen you guys do this. And the encouragement and reward here is, it's good. Do more of it. Father in heaven, thank you for enduring us. Thank you, Lord, for your patience in my life where I did all kinds of offensive things, offensive to you, hurtful to others. And you waited me out until that day at the age of 39 when you invaded my life and you gave me the faith to say yes. And all of those offenses ended up labeled formerly. And Lord, on behalf of all of us here that know you, thank you for your patience. Thank you for bearing with us. And Lord, as believers, we still struggle with stuff, and we thank you for your patience this day. We got a whole bunch of grace today we got saved, but we need grace this day. And so thank you for bearing with us. Lord, teach us to surrender to the Holy Spirit, that his perfect patience might also be ours. Help us to do that work of surrender, because that's what it is. It's not gritting our teeth or trying harder to be patient. It's letting you be you in us. And so, Father, show us how to surrender in that way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
now to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. In the name of Jesus, we all agreed as we said, amen. Hey, if you'd uh, like a little prayer, there'll be some folks back there that are delighted to pray with you or for you or on your behalf. Hope you have a wonderful week. Don't blow any fingers off.